Welcome back to the shack. Al back. Tis the festive season. I don't know if you guys got the the yeah. snow on the ground like we got. Uh, Christmas tree up. Most everybody around here sees us. Except maybe them Florida people down there. Them, that, that, that Joey and Glenna lady down there. Huh. They don't have that snow on the ground anymore. No, nah, it's starting to snow about 1130. We got like four inches. Five yeah. inches probably now. It's supposed to snow all night. It's talking about so. eight inches. So it'll be crazy tomorrow. It'll all be a right. lot of fun. Wake up early. Mm -hmm. That way you can get to work. There you go. But anyways. <laughs> you guys, uh, you're probably putting up your decor. You get, you know, sometimes it, simplistic is nice. Yeah. Sometimes you don't need a lot of clutter. You, you just need a bulb or three. Small numbers. Some nice little tree. Maybe a little string of bulbs here. Simplistic. Me and a, a, a and my and, and my beautiful wife and some friends. We'll call one of them's named Brad and the other one's named Becky. We used to go out once in a while and go out to eat. And uh, you know, I, I I sure miss them friends. But at any rate, we went to this restaurant one time, and uh, they had their Christmas decor up. And it was nutcrackers. Lots of nutcrackers. Thousands. Really? Is it a restaurant? I'm thinking it was almost, yeah, it was a restaurant. It was almost creepy, the amount of nutcrackers that was around. Like a scary movie? Well, creepy. yeah, because they got that. Yeah. You know that, the jaw thing, you know? Yeah. little and, goatee. Yeah, I mean, and, and some of them's like seven foot tall, and some of them's like this big on the shelf. Uh, sometimes you don't need them kind of numbers. Sometimes things are better in small amounts, smaller numbers. Small amounts. So. And I think just with that simple truth, I think God feels the same way based on what I, the Bible I read, you know, which is weird, you know, because would you say the church or Christians in America, do you think we are more concerned about fighting the battle that God has for this world, right? Because Jesus did say he's not here to bring peace, he's here to bring the sword. And would you would you say that's coming from the pulpit, that, that strategic theology of how we can engage into that battle? Or do you think maybe the main concern is getting a thousand nutcrackers in your restaurant, getting more numbers in the church? In the church? And then putting on these little things here and there just to get numbers, you know. There was a story about a, a Francis Chen. We I listen to him every once in a while, but um, he had talked about a church that he was a minister at, and he said that they were so big on this Christmas thing, pageant and everything, and he said that to the point where you know they would be there twice a week, rehearsing, getting ready, and he said they would have such a huge number for this Christmas thing they put on and he says after they had put this thing on he he went up to one of the head ministers and asked him he says hey why aren't we doing this like to get people to christ you know why aren't we meeting together and going to house to house or why aren't we doing actual lord's work and he said you know you know you guys got all these people dressed up singing goofy songs and the head minister said well, people, they won't do that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But they'll dress up in tights, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And practice two times a week, you know? And, right. And, you know, maybe we've become a little mushy, you know? But we wanted to talk about, in this time that we're in, how do you... We're getting drove out of those places, kind of. We kind of are, which is... Which a, is, could, could be a good thing. Could be a blessing. We're taken out of our comfortable pews or our comfortable right. third row back on the right side uh, pew that we sit in every Sunday morning. And, you know, that's kind of our designated spot. And that's where we always sit. And that's what we do. We go there for a couple hours, sit there, and uh, then... So we show up for a potluck, say hi. Yep, yep. Love them Sunday dinners or, or yeah. you know, there's something going on there. There, you know, there's a special speaker <laughs> come in or maybe there's a, you know, it's all to get some numbers. places it's, it's about the numbers. It revolves around number. Have you noticed that? It revolves about the numbers. Yeah. It's really a number game. It's a number game. And so 
we wanted to look at what God thought about numbers and how he worked and maybe a little bit of encouragement because the churches are, they're getting smaller right now because you can't go, you know, everybody's afraid of, of this thing. There are a lot of churches doing what this is right here. Yeah, and they'll do this thing, which, you know, that's they'll, a good thing. They'll do their services on, you know, have a little pot or little, little, little video thing or, uh, you know, getting it into the homes one way or another. You yeah. Know? But our point tonight is what we wanted to bring you guys is God, he's not impressed with large numbers. And we're going to prove that to you tonight. In fact, he prefers a small band of true Christians, a small band of fighters, a small band of soldiers. And so we're going to name this one tonight, Guerrilla Warfare. Guerrillas. Guerrilla Warfare. And um, so what is Guerrilla Warfare? Because we, we seem to, to see that's how God likes to fight. Mm -hmm. And we, we're going to get into some guerrilla warfare. So let's define what guerrilla warfare is. I got a definition. It's a small band of men who strike enemies and then they flee. Uh, war, they war like this due to their size, their tiny size, and the enemy's formidable size. Um, they're quick, and when they strike, they do it quickly and Precisive, and they are able to improvise. So that's pretty much guerrilla warfare in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Small. Sounds right. Strategic. To me. That sounds like you hit the nail on the head, sir. Yeah, I think you got it. I nailed it. I think so. That was a small strategic strike of definition there. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to prove to you that God thinks this way, and He prefers small groups of believers um, doing a great work. Um, what what book do you got open there? If you guys this want to turn to this, Judges chapter six. Okay, there's a guy named Gideon in there. Gideon, Gideon, and then in verse the first time I ever heard of Gideon. Where's the first time you ever heard Gideon? I think it's like Sunday, uh, like uh, what is it? What is the thing called with a bunch of kids? The, the Sunday school, probably the story of Gideon. But yeah, yeah. First time I ever heard Gideon was I, you guys. I don't. You did homeschool or no? I homeschooled, so, believe it or not, for a couple uh, of years, yeah. When we was in grade school, believe it or not, before, you know, it got to where you weren't allowed to pray in school, there was an actual group of people, I think they even called themselves the Gideons or something, you get you a little, a tiny, itty bitty red Bible, the Gideon, the Gideon Bible, and I think it was just New Testament, but it's super fine print, I mean, you It's in every hotel to this day. I think it might be. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could, it could be at the nightstand. I have seen that it. Now that is you awesome mentioned. that you bring that up. Yeah, the Gideon. That's the first time I ever heard Gideon yeah. as as far as a kid. That was in grade school, which think about that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So I've been in the 70s when we got, you know, when I got my little Gideon book. And I probably got a couple of them through the years as right. far as in school. But uh, I still see them around. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a small strategic attack. That, that's Drop a small little baby yeah. bubbles in every Sneak hotel. Sneak them in there from when you're young. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's not bad. I like that. I like that. It was like a little that. bit of grill warfare when we were a little bit, right but, there. But we pups back then. Right, just yeah. we pups. <laughs> but we pups. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to talk about Gideon. He's going to read um, Judges. Do you want to, or do you I want can. to bust it out? I'm not a very good reader. Well, you got the small print. I don't have good reading skills, Seth. <laughs> but I'll try. Judges 6, verse 11. Uh, there's a guy named Gideon, and we're going to just jump into it. Okay. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which is which is which which was an Oprah, that pertained to the Johash and Abazirite. See, that's a tough word for me. Abazirite. Yeah, that's a tough word for everybody. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. All right, so... So he's he's hiding out because before this they're talking about they're at war. They're being pretty much oppressed because they not, didn't follow God. They're not really following God's law. Well, laws. yeah, and they actually had idols and all kinds of stuff, and they were doing things doing that they should not thing. have been doing. And they weren't following God and God was punishing them. Yeah. These people were coming into their country, basically well, wherever they were stashed, and they had to go hide out in the hills and the yeah. caves and all this well, stuff. They were being the pretext and this. persecuted. Yes. And mm -hmm. they'd come in and wipe them out as far as you know, their land, if they grew crops, they come in and tear them up. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. basically they were just being persecuted constantly. So this guy's hiding out in a wine press to thrash his wheat. Right. Gideon. 
And that's where you meet him too. And it's it's funny because Gideon, he talks to this angel, and this angel starts off the conversation like, um, "Hey, Gideon, you brave man of valor." Right. He starts it off, and where is Gideon in that moment where an angel comes to him and calls him brave and a man of valor? He's in a wine press, which right. is like a big huge hiding. bowl, right? Hiding from the Midianites, uh -huh. beating wheat out. That said, Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the, his miracles, which our fathers told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivers us unto the hands of the Midianites. Right. So basically he's saying, Hey, you know, you're the Lord, you know, he ain't with me because we're getting persecuted. We're getting yeah. hammered. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They're beating up on us. Over yeah, there. yeah, 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 yeah. He's not with us, you know? And it's funny because, and you he know, knew that. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then it's interesting, too, his his demeanor, too, after that question. is almost like that one we were listening to the preacher. He said he kind of had like a sheepish response, a little offensive. Yeah. You know, because it was like, okay, call me brave. I'm in this wine, you know, press hiding from the Midianites, you call me brave, which is like, well, where have you been? You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. kind of, you know, it's just interesting how he disregarded that, a little bit of offensive. Um, but in 14, it says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this my, thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And so his response is funny, too, because he says... Um, and he said unto him, If now I have found grace in your sight, then shew me a sign that thou talkest to me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And I said, I will tarry until thou comest again. Um, but anyway, long story short, he, he tested to see if it was really him, just because it was interesting. And why, I guess, I mean, if they had been persecuted for so long, you would have your doubts, I suppose. And I mean, yeah, and, and it's not supposed to test the Lord, though. Right. Well, he just wanted to make sure it was yeah. exactly. And that's what you're supposed you to do. You are supposed to test the spirit. Yeah. You're supposed to test what you're following is true, too. Yeah. I mean, if he's going to ask you to go take on the Minionites, you want to make sure it's yeah, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make you sure you're locked just in. Just kind of like guy. if you want to go out and start spreading the gospel and the truth to the people, you better have like. I don't know, a testing period in your faith to where you're like, am I sure this is the truth? I think I think that's kind of what he was doing there. But anyway, long story short, Gideon was the weakest of the sons of his father, mm -hmm. right? Shortest, smallest. Yeah, it's just said that he, he claimed he was, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, and then it said they were the weakest tribe They were the Israel. weakest tribe and the smallest, I guess. And he was the smallest. Yeah. And he was kind of dumbfounded that God would pick him right. to do something great. And But anyway, that's an interesting point, I think, because, I mean, how many times do you think, you know, look at what we're dealing with now. we got a coronavirus. we got churches not open because they're just afraid of getting anybody sick. Not to mention there's usually, depending on what state you're in, there's a governor mandate that right. you can't, which they're not allowed to do that, by the way, due to the Constitution. But apparently we don't we don't abide by that anymore. But anyway, so we're there, and people are scattering like sheep. Church is getting smaller. They don't have a place to go. And here we are, and you're wondering, a little bit like Gideon would wonder, what on earth do you want me to do something for? Right. What can I do? Yeah, I... What? What? what where, where is my help in all this? I'm not capable of this. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And God chose him. And so, when God chose him, how many people did they start out with? They, he started gathering an army, remember? How many people did he start with? He I thought found, it was 32,000 or something, right? That, yeah, I think that's right. 32,000. And they were up against the Midianites, which... the, the Over a hundred. Over a hundred thousand. Over a hundred thousand. Right. So it's already a daunting task to start with. So you would think that would be probably pretty rough, you know. Right. Just that number alone. Yeah, you're already way outnumbered. And, but, and you're the weak tribe. Weak and you got your leader that's a little <laughs> fellow in there thrashing we hiding in a wine press. <laughs> and then so but, from there, right, yeah. God said, that's too many. Right. 
I want to make sure they know this is from me. Right. In other words, I'm not, you know, you got too many guys. I don't want them going out there and if they're going to win this battle, and then they're going to say, oh, we did this with a small number. We did this. Yeah, we you did You know, like the football players do. Yeah. The end zone. Little. I did this. No, no, your team got you there. It's your true. lineman knocked the guys down. You know. Sad but true. Sad but true. But anyways, so after that, God says, hey, basically go and talk to him. Tell him whoever doesn't want to really fight. His heart's not really in it. Right, scared. To, to take off. If you're afraid, be gone. And so 22,000 people left. Yeah. And he was left with 10,000. And so we were talking about, what was the 10,000 like? You know, like... Uh, where, where are they going? <laughs> where are they going? <laughs> where, where, Gideon, what are you, where did these guys... Did you, okay. Did you send you, them? God said to do that. Okay. To okay. Go get food? All right. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. Is, what's going on here? You're getting takeout or what's going on? They're sharpening swords for us. I'd love to have been a yeah. fly on the wall though, just yeah. to be a part of that. What just happened? Which I think they were pretty. I think because their persecution was as bad as it was, they yeah. rose up. I'm sure he was. Yeah. 10, I mean, 000. he had to get them guys to come. I mean, and I'm sure it wasn't just at gunpoint. These guys showed up showed for a reason. Up for a reason. Yeah. So anyway, 22 were afraid, 10,000. God looked at the 10,000 against more than 100,000. And even then he said, still, still too many. many. And so he said, take them down to the river, the well. And whoever laps like a dog. I think the way I understood it gets on the ground. Yeah, like on all fours. And, and then just, just basically stuffs drink, their face. I'm guessing the river, that's how yeah. it was, yeah. You know, like have you ever like walked or ran or conditioned or something, and when you get to that water fountain, you're just trying to breathe it in, it in at that yeah. time, you know. So I'm sure they did some PT, then they went down the river and see how they were going to drink. He says, whoever would take their hand and scoop it up and just kind of keep an eye on their flanks and stuff, he says, those are the only men I want you to allow to fight. And so after all that whole testing period was over, I guess there were 300. They got down to 300. 300. And God said, that's just right. Yeah, that's just right. <laughs> it's not too hot. Not, not too, too cold. cold. Just, just right. right. 300 is a good temperature, apparently. Right. Yeah. 300 um, was a good even number, and he figured that we could do this with this. We can deal with 300. Yeah. And so there you go. You had 300. And what did they use to fight with? Trumpets and, and pots. Yeah, and like flasks, basically. Something right? like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't hear much fire. about it. There were fire. Was there fire? There was a torch, yeah. Okay. And then they, what happened, they basically, after he did all that, he, he surrounded the tent. See, of, eight here, it says what they did. Read it up. Uh, Do you want to? Is it verse eight? I think so. It says, so the people took the, the victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent out the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, contained those 300 men. Most of the Benidian was beneath him in the valley, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. Oh, you're back a little further. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, yeah, I went too far. Didn't but, it, yeah, you're before we got to that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we paraphrased a lot. But anyway, if you get further into it. Yeah, I got that wrong. That's okay. They, they basically bum-rushed this tent with torches, and Which God had slid in there too, and them guys had a they one of them had a dream about that they were going to lose this battle. Right. They were going to they were so, going to rise up against them. So the seed had been planted. God had already planted the fear in them. Right. The seed was planted, and word had spread around in that camp of the Midianites that they were already were, scared. They already got there was a little, something that was uneasy. Yeah, there was a stench in the air. Yeah, yes. and then when them 300 dudes come across that hill... You like that stench in the air. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when those 300 dudes come across that hill with torches and flasks and banging and stuff, they got so afraid that the massive army of more than 100,000 people, they lost their wits about who they were, and they thought the guy next to them... Was right. their enemy. Right. So and they ended started, up killing one another. They started, started slaughtering yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah. Not knowing who out was. Out of the who. confusion. Yeah. Just out of the fear and the confusion, it gripped them. And so there we have Judges, chapter 6 through 7 through 8, um, talking about Gideon and how he picked 300 men. And I mean, I just think that's so amazing to me because it's God prefers a small group of men over a large group of of you know believers 
And that's in verse seven. Uh, looks like in about 17, it starts talking about what they did. Just, I'm sorry. I, I was way early on that last. No, that's okay. I mean, but I just, just so you guys know, if you get into, if you get into Judges six and seven and well, you can, the whole, it, all through there, it's, and then it talks about what Gideon did from there on out. Right. Just so you guys got that. Yeah. And then basically Jesus did the same thing too with the disciples. If you look Think at about that, he, he picked 12 men and he turned the world upside down with 12 dudes. Well, if you think about what, and I think that maybe that we were talking about that because we, we was listening to that. It said something about the, uh, Jesus, you know, he fed them multitudes, 3,000, you know what I mean? 5,000, two loaves of fish. And yeah. He had a way of sneaking off. You know what I'm saying? In other yeah, words, he... real warfare. Right. He would he would work with them, but he knew, you know, some of them guys were just there for the free meal, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then he would move on to the next town. Right. I mean, how many times in the Gospels do you see God preaching and feeding? Right after feeding the 5,000, Jesus escaped to the mountains, was praying. He says, yeah. I'm going to meet you guys over on the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, because they were moving. Right. It was like... Guerrilla, on the run. Yeah, guerrilla warfare. Like, let's go hit this area. And then, hey, let's move to this area and hit this area before anybody knows we're here. Right. You know what I'm saying? But before, that could be, yeah. I never, yeah, I never thought of it that know, way. Before either. we get too many before the people, Romans show up. Yeah. Yeah. Till we like start getting too much suspicion going on here and there. And so, if you look at that way, I mean, that really takes takes you out of the church building, though. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It takes you out of the church building, and it makes it more of like what it was cement to be, you know what I'm saying? Not saying that we shouldn't meet for church because that's definitely in a commandment, you know, in the New Testament. That's a practice of the New Testament, you know what I'm saying? But I think what Jesus really tried to show us and what God is, is he can do great things with a small group of people. And he is not waiting around for the majority like we are. See, we're waiting around for the majority. We're waiting around for everybody to believe in Jesus Christ, and then then we can feel okay to talk to people about it. But it's not going to be that way. Right. Because it it never will be that way because this world is, is controlled. And it says actually in the scriptures that Satan is the God of this world. And Jesus did not come to, to, to bring world peace. He came to separate those that follow Satan and those that follow him. And that was his mission, and that's what he was here to do. And so what we wanted to talk to you guys about is we just wanted to make sure you understand that we're in a fight. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, oh, all our, our churches are shrinking or, or we're not doing as much with a group of people. Guys, this is, God is at work now more than possibly we could say he was before, because now he's got the odds stacked against him. And this is how he works. He wants the odds stacked against him. And to the point where he'll make the odds against himself. Just to prove a point that, listen, it never was the, your congregation that did this. Yeah. It was me. It was God. Yeah. You know, I was in control of that. If anything good came from that, it was because of me. It wasn't because of you. And God can do that with a minority. Um, we were talking about some history things, which were really cool. What was that guy's name? Oh, I was hoping you wrote it down. Marion Francis. Marion, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys know about Marion Francis? I guess he was um, he was a general France, or something yeah. in the Indian He'd War. He'd come here to escape persecution from France, right? Well, his parents did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then he grew up here. This he, is... Uh, uh, 1700s. Right. Yeah, just say this is revolutionary, revolutionary stuff, right. times. And it was in South Carolina was where it took place. That's where he's, he lived. But North, anyway... North or south? South. Okay. Yeah, right. for sure south. And then he um, he, he fought the Indian War. Yeah. And he became a general there, apparently, because he had like some amazing tactics of guerrilla warfare. He was a guerrilla warfare fighter. He was a genius, really, if you want to look at him up. So come around the Revolutionary War time... The, word got around. The word got around about this Marion Francis. They actually, the Britons gave him a nickname, called him the Swamp Fox. Yeah. Do you guys ever hear about the Swamp Fox? You can like go. That's on a him. really cool story. Yeah, really cool story. Um, but anyway, what he would do is he would have a band of no more than twenty people with him. 
20 to 40. 20 to 40. Yeah, yeah 20 to 40, 40 people. And and a little would, bit of everybody. Yeah. Kids. Oh, uh, yeah, like the blacks and their white. Black, whites, white, and kids. kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he would have just about the, the weirdest Ragtag. group. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the Buttercream Gang, yeah. you know. But um, he would cause so much destruction on the Britain's army that they could not stand this guy. Yeah. And it actually came when William Gates um, from the Colonial Army came down to the south. Um, they were going to meet, uh, what was it, Cornwallis? Yeah. Cornwallis. From the, the England. Yeah. Corn Pop? Corn Pop Wallace. Corn Pop. Yeah, he was a bad dude. Corn Wallace was a bad, he was a bad dude. Uh, yeah. This is an insight. I don't joke. want to go on that. But anyways, um, so they were meeting him, and so... Um, but I digress. Yeah, so when the regiment showed up, so they all gathered, I guess, when uh, this William Gates guy showed up. He gathered the troops. Right. And they were going to defend and fight against the Britons. So when the regiments gathered... Well, Swamp Fox, he shows, up with, he his shows crew. up with his crew, and I guess... He said, Britain, you know, they're, they're you know, our, our Continental Army's down there, and they're all in their button dress, and, you know, Looking probably fine. got their goofy wigs on, or yeah, I'd yeah, imagine yeah. everything yeah, that they got wooden going. wooden teeth. Their wooden teeth, everything there. was looking prim and proper, and these guys show up, and it's a bunch of ragtag... Uh, I mean, they look like the swamp people just come out, and, yeah. and the only thing that they had kind of distinguished was black leather hats or something, wasn't it? And then what they said, yeah, their leather, black leather hats is what was their kind of their coat of uh, clothing. So they kind of laughed at them. They look like the best I can guess is what they look like based on what the history says about them. Is they look like homeless folks, and when they came, it said because of their wretchedness of attire, right. The, the whole regiments, they laughed at him. And, right. and basically, William Gates, he was not impressed at all. And so he ended up sending um, the Swamp Fox, Marion, Francis Marion, he sent him on this errand. Just, just to get rid of him. Just get out of here, dude. Yeah. Like, we can't Just send him you. on a well, snipe hunt, more or less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you hear about that, snipes? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lots yeah. of snipes in the area. Yeah. How about Shit. you go find one? Yeah. But anyway, that's what he did. So when he did that, these guys go fight. Yeah. How did William Gates and his his prim and proper crew do? The prim and proper guys got their butts handed to them. Pretty good. Uh, who was it? What did it say? Whoever, the ones that won killed or injured or maimed or captured, taken prisoner. Yeah, yeah captured. Uh, he says were wiped out. They were running. Yeah. A lot they of were on the run. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so Marion Francis and his little snipe mission, he heard Bomb. about this. Yeah. yeah. And so he came riding on back to see what he the could do. The Swamp Fox come, went right down to where the where the battle was in South Carolina. And guess what he ran across? Was it one hundred and fifty? One hundred and fifty of, of the of the colonial troops, uh, and they had how many? Thirty people leading them. Were well, prisoners? I don't know about the number of Britons, but they're they're taking them to prison. Yeah, they yeah. Were they captured. Were, they soldiers. were marching them out of there. Yeah. Yep. So Marion Francis and his Gang of misfits, you yeah. could say, probably. Um, he put together a plan. Put together a, a genius strategical plan, and he saved those colonial soldiers. Right. He freed them. And even after he saved them... And they still didn't have much to do with it. They still, based on what he looked like and who he was, they really... They, what they say, he would have been the George Washington of the South, basically. He was, He yeah. was that notorious. No, that well, notorious. Yeah. And, but even after he saved them, they didn't want to fight with them. Just based on history of apparently what he looked like or how his tactics were. Well, what it said was he was backwards. perfectly fine with that because he would rather do what he was doing best. With exactly. his 20 ragtag people, he kicked butt. I was going to say he wasn't discouraged when they didn't want to fight with him. Yeah. You know, the people he he didn't want to fight with him because, I mean, he was already very happy with his little strategic way of 20 or 40 people doing right. his thing. Um so I guess we bring up that story to say, guys, do we get discouraged when stuff like that happens or when we don't have a large number of people fighting with us? I, I think it's a worldly way of thinking. It's bad theology, really. Mm -hmm. But yes, we do. And honestly, if you look at it, God works with small numbers. And he works with the people that are serious and that are fighters. He doesn't work with the mushy middle. You know, what did we say? 
that another point that he brought up, this guy we were listening to, was uh, during the time of this settling, revolution. this revolution war that's going on, the colonists here, there was only like 15% of the, the height, country. At the height, it was like 15% were fighting this. Yeah. The rest of them were okay and content with going to British rule. They were okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in perspective. 15%. So now that goes into what you're saying. Yeah. So 15%. Revolution, yeah. like you just said, yeah, and it said about ten percent of the Britons they were, they were all gung ho about taking America as a Brit British colony in the height of the Revolutionary War, and so with that said, I think that's very an accurate depiction of what we got going on here, right? It can be. I think we got seriously think about this. I think there's ten percent of the population, ten percent of people. They're just on fire, righteous, love God, will do anything for him or his church or others. You hope there's more than that. But. Yeah, but about 10% of strong. 10% strong. Strong, strong. Strong, strong. And right. then you got another 10% of the population are like the most wretched, abominable, hating God. They like they're the, the evil of the evil. They're evil people. And they're they're notoriously set out to do evil things. You got 10% of those people. And then 80% of everybody else is pretty much people that as long as they have, what he say, a six-pack in their blockbuster. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was a good, that was an awesome analogy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're okay with whatever, you know. you know. William Churchill or Stalin, it don't matter as long as I get to live my self Do what I, do me. Life. As long as I do me. Yeah. Yeah. As long as I have a nice car and garage and... Couple yep. bucks, you know, to get what I want. And TV remote thing. batteries are charged. Everything yeah. is good. That's it. And so, really, if you look at it that way, that's the battlefield. And it always has been the battlefield. It's a minority group against the minority group that are fighting in the middle of the mushy middle. Yeah. And you're fighting middle. for those people. Um, and so, with that said, we want to just kind of encourage you to say, you know what? Where are we at in this country? Where are we at politically? Where are we at spiritually? You know, we're being persecuted in a way, attacked by in a way. Possibly a little bit like Gideon, not maybe as bad, but maybe it's to be seen. Let's put it that way. And, you know, a lot of people will get discouraged because we're going to think, well, we don't have the numbers. Well, guys, guess what? We never had the numbers. God doesn't work with the majority. He works with the minority. You know, he works with a small group of men. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one more history lesson we wanted to get. One more you time. Want to do that one? Time. It's Irish. You got to. You do. You want that one because it's Irish. Yeah, you have to. All right. So I really got to make sure we pick up what we need to do. As, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think there's. There's so paraphrase or quick. Okay. So there's the. Well, I'll jump into it. So number one, I guess. What should we do as a church that is in guerrilla warfare, that we have to improvise with the situation that we're dealt with? How can we practically go about this in our lives? And I think there's like a couple points. And the first point is, church in America is lacking a theology to sustain their followers because of the filth that is coming out of the pulpit. It is, it, is, it is not teaching the You're gonna flock. You're going to go there. I'm going there. Okay. It's not he teaching. He went there. I went there. It's not teaching the population, the following of Jesus Christ, how to fight. Okay. Would you agree with that? Not every. I, I'm not saying Not every, church. but you got the, there's definitely, it's more about the show and go, and here's the plate, and right. we got to keep this train rolling than it is about let's, let, let's dig down deep and see where your soul's at. Exactly. Yeah. And how do you fight? And so I would say the majority of that is they're not prepping the fighters. They're not teaching you how to fight. They don't, I mean, what are we doing? Right. You know what I'm saying? As long as you go to church one day a week, you should be getting to heaven. That's, yeah. that's not true. Right. You see what I'm saying? Number right. two, I think important um, is when fighting for a, another king, so his law can be established in the land. That the fighters live as if the rule is a reality. Uh, 
And so we'll go, basically there is a, this is basically what it is, is if you're going, I'm going to say it one more time, important when fighting for another king, so his law can be established in the land, the fighters must live as the rule of that king is already a reality. And so when we look at what we're supposed to be doing, we're, we're looking at God as the king. And the reality is that he has rule. Yeah. And so we should we be look, living under that rule. Yeah. When we look at him as our king and trying to permeate this rule onto the land, we ourselves have to act and have to be living under that rule as if it was already ruling. Right. right. I get what um, you're saying. You see what I'm saying? That's deep, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, and then, so yeah. so from there, I'll jump into the, the Irish guy. Because that's the perfect song. Ah, you love the Irish. <laughs> the Irish is going to be good. That red in your hair is something going on. <laughs> we'll finish it with the Irish, and it'll be great. <laughs> so there's a guy named Michael Collins, okay? Um, he wrote a, there's a Dave Leverell, Leverell? Leverell or something. Leverell, whatever. Leverell. Uh, he wrote a letter to Michael Collins. And in that letter, um, he, he wrote, he said, the Irish Republic, we must live as the Irish Republic is a fact. And at the time, you know, there were some, no, 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 that was, that was the good one. We must live as God, uh, but anyway, go out and fight. Right. And in other words, is like, you have to live for, and you have to believe in your fight and you have to go for it. Like it, you're already, it's you're reality already to you. It's reality. You know? Right. And so... This is not something I'm aspiring to. It's already happening. Right. And so if you look at the church, and if you look at Christians, you know, they get bored of their faith. I would say a majority, the majority does. I'm uh, guilty of that. Yeah, we all are. I've slid off of it, you know? You know, and if you are bored of your faith, or if you get discouraged easily, or you're just not involved, what's the cause of that? You're not fighting. You're not fighting. And then what it because what do soldiers do when they're not fighting? I mean, we just look in psychology right now. They get bored. Yeah. Don't they? They have problems. Right. Don't they? Yeah. There's major issues in their families. There's major issues everywhere because when a soldier because that's what they're there to do. They're they're bred to fight. And when soldiers come home and they're not fighting, they become bored. And it's the same way for Christians. You know, if you're if you're not really, if you're bored as a Christian. Yeah, if you're not, then really, you're not in the fight. Then you're not fighting. Yeah. Period. You're not part of the ten percent, I guess. Right. You know. Um, and so when you look at that, it's something that you guys we want to make sure you understand, and you don't become that. You know, you, you are a fighter, and you see what's happening, and you know. You got to finish your buddy's you. story, though. But anyway. So many people are waiting around for fighters. Right. Right. Go be the fighter. Um, so this guy and his brother. Yeah. Let me see. What does it say? Okay. And well, I mean, go back. How do you be a fighter? Re wreak havoc on the wicked. You know, don't be afraid to go outside the box and do some things that, that would otherwise get you out of your comfort zone. I mean, you, you have to fight. That's what you're here I for. I was just talking to a fellow tonight to talk... To give me a little insight, it's a guerrilla warfare. Yeah? Yeah. Who's that? <laughs> I think I know. Some old fellow from PA. Right. I got so, it. Yeah. He's going to probably listen to this one because he knows I'm going to talk smack about him. But anyhow, he said he's at the Lowe's and he got a big roll of wire on his shoulder. And not to take away from your story, your no, Irish no, story. No, I don't want right. to ruin the Irish it's story. It's good. But you're, this guy is Irish, so... So I'm good. We're still, still on. Still an Irish story. So anyhow, he's got this roll of wire on his shoulder, and he's walking out of Lowe's, and the guy comes up to, hey, hey, do you do electrical work? He says, yeah, I do. Like, because this 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 friend of mine, uh, it, 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 better than an acquaintance, is he's uh, he does uh, uh, construction work on the side, and he can do it all, plumb, wiring, everything. Anyhow, so he says, yeah, I, I do that stuff on the side. He said, well, you got a phone number? He says, yeah. He says. He says, I'll give you my number. And he says, he says, I will tell you this though. He says, if if you have me come work on your house, you are gonna have to listen to G about Jesus. He says, I will be talking about Jesus if I come and work on your house. Can't help it. Can't help it. Grill warfare. I love that example. That's pretty awesome. And I decided to put it on here tonight because I think that's I, I, that's a, a tactic. I like that. Yeah. Slide it in there. You know, you, you don't have to beat him with a Bible. You can start just like what he did right there. That's just an awesome example of guerrilla warfare 
as what we're doing right now. Right, and isn't that guerrilla warfare to its definition? Yeah. Sneak in under the radar. Yeah. Place a see. strategic attack. Uh huh. Right, and then back away. If the guy calls him, then he'll talk about it. Yeah. You know that's guerrilla warfare, and that's how God works, and that's how Jesus. But if we're works. showing it all the time, we have to show it. But we you have, have to, to live be, under that. We rule. have to be living under that rule. Exactly. If you don't live under that and rule, acting like and act like it's a fact, well, then you're you're not a part of God's army. Then, right. Period. There's right. it's no there's no in the middle with God. It's either you're for Him or against Him. Yeah. And and we wanted to leave you with this story because this is these guys were guerrilla warfare fighters. There was a small group. His name was Richard Cameron. He's a Scottish, um, they were called Ke- Covenanters. It's like 1600s or something. Is that when this yeah, was? Yeah, it, it was, was back, back in there. the day. But they were yeah. also being persecuted. And they were a religious group. Um, they actually had a, had coined a nickname. They were called the Hunted. If you guys want to you know, look up some history about this, that's what they actually called them, the Hunted. Um, but anyway, there's about... 60 men, right, that fought with Cameron. That. Yep, and, he, and his brother. Yep, and um, they were known as the Hillmen. That's what they called themselves. Um, I'm but, guessing they wore kilts, but go ahead. Right, yeah, there's a probably good chance they wore some kilts, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, there was uh, some, This it's interesting because it's very like, it's back and forth with our generation. They were religious leaders, they were religious people. And some of their groups thought it was wrong to fight right. the British, right? right? And so while, and then the other Europeans, yeah, whatever, the other, yeah, yeah Europe, whoever they were, but yeah. who? Then I think it was Britain, but I, they were always beating down the Scottish. But anyway, and then the other side of them said, "We got to fight." You know, we're not going for my brother over here. That's going to keep his hand in his pocket. He says, "We're we're going to fight for him." Right. We're not going to let them. Kill him. Even though they don't want to fight because they think it morally wrong, we're I'm, fighting. I'm going to protect we're fighting my for him. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to protect yeah. my brother, and that's kind of the way they looked. Um, but there were 60 men known as the Hillmen, and they would they traveled the hillside, and about they were known in the history books. They were known about noon every day to pray and have a Bible study. Yeah. And you know, just particularly the day that these these guys died was uh, they just got done the way the history books put it. They they just got done with a Bible study and prayer, and through the mist and over the hill they saw the dragoons, which was their enemy, and they were extremely outnumbered. And there were all these dragoon dragoons that were just totally surrounded them, uh, greatly outnumbered. Horse and, on horse. And, yep. And then um, Cameron's Richard's brother uh, Michael was with him because he fought with him, which he was called Michael the Inseparable um, because he was very loyal to yeah. him, I guess. But anyway, when they looked at each other and saw that they were outnumbered, they said, Michael, this is the day we are waited for. We are going to receive our crowns today. You know, we're we fighting th- against God's enemies. Yeah, we are fighting against God's enemies, and today is the day we receive our crown. Yeah. What an amazing perspective. And guys, that's that's a small band of men. Because honestly, those that join on with a large group, you know, nine times out of ten they're sissies, right? I'm only going to join because we have the majority, right? Right. That's the reason I'm Safety joining. in numbers. So that's, I'm going with the... It's kind of like a fair That church fan. has got 2,000. This one's got 50. I'm going with the 2,000. 2,000, they, right. they got to be doing something right. It's kind Safety of, in numbers. So. Right. It's kind of yeah. like the Fairweather fan. How many of you are sport fans? You hate the Fairweather fans because they're not true fans. They only join when things are good. Right. Same thing. You know, if you join when things are the majority, you know, you're going to miss out God. You're going to miss out on God. But so, guys, what a great perspective to have. You know, today is the day. That's the way they lived, that we receive our crown from our true king because we we live under his rule. Yeah. And so I guess what we wanted to bring to you guys is guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare. Start using your tactics uh, even if you're a small or you're you're trapped in a house or maybe you're old, el- older or maybe uh, got health issues or whatever, there's still tactics. Mm-hmm. God's going to use you. God's got them. Them 
that that's the people he uses. Look what he did with Gideon. Yeah. You know, look, the woman at the well. I mean, there's so many examples in the Bible. We talked about her too, you know, the yeah, woman at the well. One person did. She went back and, and, told, everybody. and told everybody that he knew her. He, he knew that he, she had had several husbands and the things about her. But through her, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's amazing. And so, guys, are you bored? Are you sick and tired of not feeling like you have a very good faith? Well, it's because you're not fighting. Start fighting. It's time to start fighting. Go out and fight. Doesn't matter. God, he prefers a small group. Yeah. And so you don't have to be met with a large group. Take a friend. Take one friend, two friends. God will do amazing things as long as you're willing to fight and live under his rule. And so that's what we want to bring to you guys tonight. So we are in the midst. Keep praying. Yeah. Keep reading your Bible. Keep reaching out to people, whether through emails or through your cell phone. Give them a call. But slip that little mind in there. Yeah. Talk about Jesus. Slip that little tripwire in there for them. You don't have to beat them with the Bible. Just bring it up. Start fighting for their souls. Right. Start fighting for other people's souls. Start fighting the enemy where he least expects it. And it, you have to be, you have to live under his rule to do that. You have to believe it's a fact in your life. So, guys, we're going to leave you with that. Don't be discouraged. Guys, Francis was not discouraged when they didn't want to come fight with him after he saved him. Yeah. Neither will you be because you aren't fighting so that people will join and your numbers will grow. You're fighting because you know God is with the small group of people that are dedicated to the fight. And so that's what we wanted to leave you guys with tonight. We love you. Guys, pray for this country. Pray for everybody. Pray for the church. Pray for, um, we just need to pray. If you haven't uh, given to the cause of Jesus Christ, do it. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys want to know how to become a Christian, if you want to give your life to Christ, Acts chapter 2 is a good place to start. Believe and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And there's another faith tribe that likes to put an emphasis on accepting them into your heart, which I honestly believe, I mean, that has to take place as well. Yeah. You have got to. All part of the puzzle. I think, yeah, I think everybody has the puzzle pieces. We just got to put them together, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think it it includes all of it. It's, it's the truth. You have to make him a part of who you are. You got to obey what he says to do. And we've got to start fighting again for the truth and for God. That way he'll be with us. So we're going to leave that. And we love you guys. We're going to say a prayer. And I just shaved my head yesterday, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> Woo! A little chilly for that. It is. For a couple of days, man. I've been just got to chill down my spine. But we're going to say a prayer, and we're going to see you guys there. Dear most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to to encourage ourselves by this study and hopefully encourage whoever's listening, Father, to keep fighting. Lord, you are with us as long as we remain true and humble to you and your cause. Father, help us never to be prideful and think we have the answers um, about our life or about our theology, but we always look to the scriptures, we always look to your wisdom and your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to all the knowledge that we desire and that we we choose to fight with and to share with others. We love you, Father. Please forgive us for our sins like we forgive those that sin against us. Please be with all those that are sick, and please, Lord, be with this country. Be with our leaders and be with our people. And it's in your precious and holy Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night, guys. Have a good night.